following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, 200 pounds. And as soon as I picked it up off the rack, it flipped out of my hand. Right onto his neck. Instantly, I knew that I was in trouble. One weightlifter is left gasping for air. I should have died in three and a half minutes. How was he able to tell his story today? I should have been paralyzed. The answer? God was just showing off. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Open for business sooner than predicted. President Trump now saying America's social lockdown will last weeks, not months. Meanwhile, coronavirus infections are surging at unprecedented rates in New York State. The big question is, Congress any closer to delivering a relief package? George Thomas has the latest. With millions of people facing the prospects of losing their jobs and a once booming economy showing signs of deep recession, the president says he wants the country open for business sooner than predicted, even as the coronavirus continues to spread and hospitals brace for a wave of virus-related deaths. America will again and soon be open for business, uh, very soon, a lot sooner than uh, three or four months that somebody was suggesting. The Treasury Department set to release new jobless claims on Thursday. Experts predicting the numbers could be in the millions as more states order all non-essential businesses closed and one out of four Americans forced to stay home. The president tweeting, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself, adding that he's going to re-evaluate federal guidelines on social distancing next week. We can't shut in the economy. The economic cost to individuals is just too great. On Capitol Hill, gridlock, as lawmakers try to come to an agreement on a near $2 trillion aid package. You know what the American people are thinking right now, Mr. President? They're thinking that this country was founded by geniuses, but it's being run by a bunch of idiots. Democrats say the plan leans too heavily in favor of corporate bailouts. The GOP accusing Democrats of trying to embed a liberal agenda. Senator James Langford of Oklahoma pushing a charitable giving amendment to the coronavirus aid bill that would allow nonprofit organizations to play an even stronger role in helping our nation's vulnerable individuals and families during this crisis. The not-for-profits are the bedrock social safety net of our society. The way we're set up as a culture is families take care of families. There are not-for-profits, churches and entities that are around communities, and then government comes in with assistance where needed at that point. Congressional leaders and the White House say they're close to a deal and could vote today. The Federal Reserve doing its part, agreeing to buy back government and corporate debt to keep the economy going. Meanwhile, the number of coronavirus cases exploding in the U.S. by 15 times since last week's guidelines were released. New York, now the epicenter, with more than 20,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19 and worries the city could run out of ventilators, masks and other critical supplies to care for the flood of patients. We're short on PPE that a lot of folks are short on around the country. Masks, um, face shields. The state's governor ordering all hospitals to increase capacity by 50 percent. This is going to get much worse before it gets better. More than 46,000 Americans have been infected with the virus. 593 people have died so far, 125 of those in New York City alone. Alongside those troubling numbers, the economic impact is also starting to take effect. Heather Sells reports how coronavirus policies are affecting small businesses in Virginia. Like most of the country here in southeastern Virginia, the streets are quiet and businesses are struggling to keep their doors open. Sweeping new orders from the governor are closing many non-essential businesses for now and restricting restaurants to take out only. At the Cutlass Grill restaurant in Chesapeake, owner Sean Dawkins oversaw 47 employees just a few weeks ago. 
Now he is working the line after declining sales forced him to cut a third of his staff. The staff in it is tough in the hours because, you know, um, everyone has, they have their families um, that they have to support. So that's a difficult decision. Um, but just for the business to survive um, is something I, I had to do. Well, his dining room no longer bustles, takeout orders and fist bumping are steady. A few miles down the road, J.B. Anderson is working with half his staff at Texas Street Coffee, a neighborhood pop-up business. Drinks are strictly to go these days. It's a good sense of normality in their day that they look forward to it, even though they're home quarantined or, uh, you know, just sort of uh, on relief right now. Donna McCartney owns a gluten-free tea room that's now curbside pickup. McCartney says her customers all still crave and are ordering her specialty food. I'm actually almost busier than I was before. All three realize their hardship will likely get worse before it gets better. This week's jobless claims report is expected to be historic. Consumer spending for restaurants, entertainment and retail is already down dramatically. And analysts say it will continue to decline. It's why the Federal Reserve announced Monday that it will begin to lend to small and large businesses to help them weather the crisis. Ultimately, small businesses are depending on their local communities for support that has become essential. I think supporting local business will be, will not just be like a hipster trend right now. I think it will be something that will sustain um, small communities and um, rural communities around the nation right now. Reporting in Chesapeake, Virginia, Heather Sell, CBN News. Well, medical reporter Lori Johnson will be with us in just a moment. But first, Stephen Moore is a former Trump economic advisor and author of Trumponomics. And Steve, could you tell us what the package is that the Republicans are proposing? It's uh, a couple trillion dollars, but how is it composed? So hi, Pat. I uh, hope uh, hope everyone out there is uh, is staying healthy. And thanks for having me on again. You know, this aid package, it's too bad we even need this aid package. You know, when we were talking a month ago, the economy is flying so high. We had the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years and high growth. And here we are now in this in the midst of this crisis. And, you know, President Trump said it very well, I think, the other night when he said that uh, I, he is a wartime president. He is a wartime president. And, and the way he put it is we're fighting a war against an invisible enemy. And that enemy is this virus. The uh, Congress is now uh, moving forward with this aid package. And by the way, Pat, it's 1,400 pages long and getting longer every day. Mm. Uh, I, do, I do support providing some short-term relief for workers because, after all, it's the government that shut down the businesses because, because by government order. So it's appropriate to provide the aid that people need in the short term to get through this. And then, of course, businesses. We have 26 million small businesses in this country, Pat. 26 million. Those are the, the uh, backbone of the American economy, those men and women who we just heard from on uh, on your package, who will make the economy work, they are struggling mightily. Many of them have no revenues now for three or four weeks. Uh, revenues for a business are the oxygen that keep it alive. So there is a package that would provide loans. I wanna be very clear about this, Pat. This is not a bailout, it's not a big giveaway. It's a loan program so that businesses that are healthy businesses can get a loan from the government to get through this next six months, they will repay that money. And we need that, Pat, because we want these businesses to be able to hit the ground running as soon as we've stabilized the coronavirus. But I've got to say one other thing about this package. It just disgusts me that the Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are trying to turn this into a Christmas tree. And they're putting all of these uh, completely um, absurd items into that. They, they're putting in these global warming climate change uh, things. They want bailouts for union pension plans. They want permanent leave. Uh, those are things that maybe need to be debated, but we got to get this aid out yesterday. It's a scandal that it's taken so long to get this money to the businesses and the workers that need it. Well, they, I understand they want to include uh, Planned Parenthood and any bailouts that Planned Parenthood will be qualified to receive large amounts of government money, and the, and the Republicans say no way. Is, is that a sticking point? 
There are so many sticking points, and you know it's it's uh, hard for me to even keep up with it because the bill keeps changing all the time. I mean, how hard is it to get this done? It sh you don't need fourteen hundred pages. <laughs> you know, you need maybe a hundred pages that de defines how you're going to give the aid. But there are a lot of people out there that are struggling. You know, we have. Uh, you know, this is a scary situation right now. I mean, we have. Uh, you know, about three or four or five million people who have already signed up for unemployment insurance. The numbers could go up dramatically, obviously, as uh, the next couple of weeks roll on. Uh, it breaks my heart, Pat. I'm I'm on the board of a small company. We have about 40 employees. Uh, we're just getting going. And, you know, we had to, in the last couple of days, uh, lay those workers off. It's a terrible thing, you know, to have to lay off workers. And it's happening throughout the economy. And that's why I think the most important thing, Pat, is what Donald Trump said last night uh, in his press conference, where he said, we are going to have a plan to get the American economy up and running in the next few weeks. That has to happen. We can't go 8, 10, 12 weeks without this great American engine of our economy not operating. I mean, there will be, there will be tens of millions of unemployed people. There will be millions of business bankruptcies. People will lose their life savings. We need to get the economy up and running again. Obviously, we need to take very prudent steps on the health side to make sure people are safe. But the idea that we're going to keep this economy closed for three months, that, that, that would be dire. Uh, and I think I say bravo to Donald Trump to, to starting to take moves to reopen the economy. Well, the, the total dimension of the package are we talking about two trillion, a trillion, and a, uh, one trillion, and then three quarters, or three trillion? Well, how much money are we talking about overall? Well, I don't know if to laugh or to cry because you know every day it seems like the price tag of this goes up, Pat. And you know I've got to say something that look, this aid package has some needed uh, uh, you know uh, provisions for people. You know the thousand uh, dollars per. Uh, household and so on. I think it's now $1,200. That'll provide some short-term relief, and that's necessary for people, especially at the lower income rungs of the ladder and working class people who don't have a lot of savings to draw on. Um, so that's fine. And and then they're going to do the aid to the businesses. And by the way, the Federal Reserve uh, Bank yesterday announced they will put new liquidity in the economy. But Pat, it's very simple here. If our businesses are not operating, and we're not producing goods and services, it doesn't matter how much money the Federal Reserve prints, and it doesn't matter how much money the Congress appropriates, if there's not goods and services to buy, you know, we're going to run out of things. And so that's why I think Donald Trump is so right to have a plan to get the economy open, especially in areas, you know, look, New York is a special case. New York City is a real problem. San Francisco is a problem. There are some areas of the country where we, we have some real severe outbreaks of the virus. But other parts of the economy need to be reopened in a smart way. Uh, and we have to really, you know, we can't take trillions of dollars uh, of losses. And incidentally, once this re the uh, uh, coronavirus is stabilized and on a decline, I do believe, I, I want to sound optimistic here because I am optimistic, I think the economy will boom right back to, it's going to take, a, you know, uh, six months to a year, but we're going to get back onto a very healthy pace of growth as we had right before the coronavirus hit. Well, Steve, I appreciate so much you being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I echo what he has said. We can't make this into a Christmas tree for all these uh, special interests. It's got to be a package of, of getting our economy. For example, the airlines are, are talking about shutting down. We have to have those planes flying. Well, they, the airlines are looking at uh, $500 billion or more they need to get going. So these are loans. We loan them the money or we take preferred stock. There are a number of ways you can do it. <clears throat> it's been suggested that we have forgivable loans, and the loans are given to businesses to keep people employed. And if they do it, then after two years, that loan is forgiven, which is a good way of doing it. But whatever it is, it's got to be done now. And this, this political uh, going back and forth has got to stop. The country is in dire need, and you can imagine a man's life savings is being taken away, these small businesses. The, for example, the hotels uh, are in desperate need. The biggest hotel in New York, the Hilton in New York, the biggest hotel in the whole city, has shut down because several of the employees had coronavirus. Well, what's going to happen to those hotel companies? 
they need some help. And what about those restaurants? A guy's got 10 or 20 or 30 employees, and he has no customers. I mean, there's a desperate move, and I think it's time we stop fiddling around with this thing and get on with it. And uh, I believe the senator from Louisiana was exactly right. Geniuses put their, their uh, constitution together, and now it's being run by idiots. I mean, the, yeah. you know, we, we can't have that. It's really shocking. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I just stand back and go, what are Pelosi and Schumer and others who are following their lead mm -hmm. thinking? I mean, this is not a time for politics as usual. Yeah. One bill should be being passed yeah. that addresses one serious yeah. issue, maybe in multiple ways, nothing attached to it. Just pass the bill. I mean, how hard is that? <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Really? <laughs> well, our CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson is here for more on the latest. And uh, Lori, uh, there's some thought that maybe we've gone overboard. We've, we've contained this terrible plague. What's the risk of lifting the social restrictions too soon? Pat, the primary risk is that their, the health care system, particularly the hospitals, will not be able to handle the number of patients. We know that the United States of America has hands down the best health care in the world. We have the smartest doctors, the most technologically advanced equipment, like these wonderful ventilators that breathe for us. And now these wonderful drugs that are showing such promise and are showing that they're so effective. But these resources could run out if too many patients flood the hospitals. And that's why yesterday the White House Coronavirus Task Force said, OK, folks, everybody stay in their homes for at least one more week. And then when it comes time for us to venture outside, it's going to be on a very targeted basis. Only certain people in certain places. Why did New York uh, have this problem? Is it because of the crowding of the city? Probably. Those people are crammed in there like sardines. I love New York. I was supposed to be in New York right now on vacation. But we know that there are 28,000 people in one square mile of New York City. And so New York State is the epicenter of the country. In New York State, they have 60 percent of all coronavirus cases in the country. But then New York City, the greater New York metro area, one out of a thousand people has coronavirus. That's five times higher than the rest of the country. And then in New York City proper, it's one out of 700. And so oh, Deborah Burks, uh, who's on the White House Coronavirus Task Force, said that she thinks that this has been circulating in New York City for a number of weeks now. And so that's why the Navy ship, the USNS Comfort, is going to be docking in New York Harbor and why the Javits Convention Center, that giant convention center on the west side of Manhattan, is being converted into a hospital as we speak. So we really need to pray for New York right now. But they're tough. Look at how they handled 9-11. Well, one last question. What about these new tests that takes 45 minutes? Uh, is there a person that, I mean, is there a test you can do for yourself? Yes and yes. Oh, so this is so exciting. Uh, moving forward, you know, there's an old saying that says you can't manage something you don't measure. And so testing is the very most fundamental thing moving forward. We need to know who has this virus and who doesn't? And so now the market is being flooded with, with tests. And as of Monday, this coming Monday, there will be these rapid results tests where the results are going to be available in 45 minutes. And then on the back burner right now, the FDA still has to approve it. But some companies have already made tests that they can mail to people's homes and people can stick the swab up their nose themselves, put it in a container and send it away. And then you can get results in the mail, which is fantastic as far as the number of people who can be tested. But also that last test saves on those PPEs, the personal protective equipment, because you can do it at home. So we don't need to, to waste all the gloves and the protective equipment of healthcare workers administering these tests. Thanks, Lori. Ladies and gentlemen, I know as you're afraid, I, I want to share with you something every day we need to take heart. And in the 91st Psalm, there are seven I wills where God says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will. Today is Psalm 91:15. Here's your verse for today. I will, 
He will call on me, and I will answer him. So don't fear, because the Lord is going to look after you. But if you have a problem, you're out of work, you're losing money, you're whatever, God says, he will call upon me, and I will answer him. Say it again. I will call upon him, and he will answer me. God will answer you regardless of the circumstances. Well, in other news, travel restrictions are straining airline passengers and leaving airports looking like ghost towns. Ephraim Grimm has more on that. Pat, lockdowns are affecting travelers around the world. 16 members of a West Virginia church have been stuck in Honduras for 10 days. The Honduran government closed all borders, including the airports. The team from Morgantown Church of Christ tried contacting the U.S. Embassy and the airlines with little success. Team members say they've been told several times a plane is coming in for them, only to have their hopes dashed. The group is safe with plenty of food in their missions compound, but still don't know when they will get home. The pandemic is shutting down air travel across the globe. CBN contributor Chuck Holton flew home recently and filed this report from those empty airports. Well, if you're gonna practice social distancing, here at the airport might be the best place to be right now because as you can see, this place is a ghost town. And there are a few flights still leaving from here in Reno, Nevada, where I am, but there are very few people on those flights and many of them are being canceled. Also, as you can see, the stores and shops inside the airport mostly are closed. And that's just because there's nobody here to buy anything. So those employees who are still here to keep the airport running are very grateful, the ones that I've talked to, that they can still come to work, but they may not last very much longer. Of course, if you just came through security checkpoint, please double check your pockets. You might be missing a pair of keys. My quick flight over the Sierra Mountains left on time, but with very few people on board. And as we descended into San Francisco, it was clear that normally busy freeways are now almost devoid of traffic. The airlines are losing tens of millions of dollars every day as this shutdown continues. For example, I just landed in San Francisco and the aircraft I was on had 76 seats but only nine passengers, and five of those were United employees that were repositioning aircraft or trying to get home before they had more shutdowns. The real question is, how long can this go on? Because if it doesn't have a near end date, it may be the death knell for some airlines. All right, so I made it back to Panama within about 24 hours of them shutting down this airport for the next 30 days. And there are obviously a lot of people trying to get in and trying to get out before that happens. This is definitely unprecedented in Panama. As far as I know, it's never happened before. I don't even think the airport was closed for 30 days during the invasion of Panama. As the number of confirmed cases of the coronavirus rises above 250 in this country, Panama is hoping to contain the outbreak by declaring a nationwide shutdown for the next 30 days. Chuck Holton, CBN News, in quarantine in Panama. Unprecedented indeed. Pat? What an incredible thing. Well, you've seen it firsthand. Our, our reporters are there to give you what's happening. Now an alarming development politically. Absolutely. Coming up, the plan to subvert the Constitution Get rid of the Electoral College. Supporters of a national popular vote say they're giving people what they want. But are they setting the stage for a civil war? And then a weightlifter in bad shape, a 200 pound barbell crushes his neck and the bleeding and swelling starts to block his airways. He should have suffocated, but why didn't he? Find out later on today's program. Just imagine if the 20 largest cities in America elected our president. Well, that's not too far-fetched. The only thing standing in the way is the Electoral College. And now a number of states want to abolish it in favor of what's called a popular vote. Senior Washington correspondent Jennifer Wishon explains. 
Shall the bill pass? Virginia is the latest state to jump on the popular vote bandwagon, sweeping through blue states. Eyes 51, nays 46. Getting rid of the Electoral College would require a constitutional amendment. In order to get around that, states like Virginia are considering the Popular Vote Interstate Compact, an agreement where participating states give their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote even if it doesn't match their state's popular vote. 15 states and the District of Columbia representing 196 electoral votes have already passed the measure. All blue states that voted for Hillary Clinton in the last presidential election. In 2016, President Trump lost the popular vote by 2%, but won the electoral vote. Just days after his surprise victory, prominent liberals started sounding the alarm to change the rules. This has happened twice now yeah. uh, since 2000. Al Gore and now Hillary. And it seems to be happening to one party. Only us. Only Democrats. Right. Which is, of course, the way they would want it. Yeah. You kind of can't blame them for that. But how do we fix that? There's a simple solution to it. We have to just abolish the Electoral College. Yeah. It's not... Our founding fathers, however, chose the Electoral College as the constitutional system of selecting a president. It was a compromise between having Congress and citizens choose the commander in chief. The founders came up with a brilliant way of saying every state needs to have a voice and the people need a voice as well, and that's the Electoral College. Let's face it, it can be a bit confusing. In fact, the National Archives begins its explanation this way. The Electoral College is a process, not a place. That process consists of 538 electors chosen by states. Each state has the same number of electors as its members of Congress. To win the White House, a presidential candidate must get at least 270 electoral votes. Supporters say the system protects states' interests by forcing candidates to cater to the diversity of the nation. A blue voter in California may have different interests from a blue voter in Vermont. In fact, under a popular vote system, many experts predict rural Americans would be left out altogether. If you just went to popular vote, there are 35,000 cities in the United States. 20 cities have the majority of the vote in America. You could win a presidential campaign by just spending your time at 20 cities. Who cares about the other 34,980 cities? We're just going to ignore them. And then there's the possibility of states being forced to support a candidate their people didn't want. For instance, if this proposed popular vote system had been in place for 2016, all of Tennessee's 11 electoral votes would have gone to Clinton, even though 61 percent of Tennesseans voted for Trump. Conversely, if Trump had won the popular vote, a state like California that voted 62 percent for Clinton would have to give its 55 electoral votes to a Republican. And that could spell trouble. You'd have insurrection all over the United States. I think you would have likely riots in the streets. You would have violence as a result. Only five times in history has a presidential candidate lost the popular vote and won the White House. Still, over the past 200 years, more than 700 proposals have been introduced in Congress to eliminate or change the Electoral College. None have succeeded. Then, as now, many political scientists think it's short-sighted. It's not really looking at the future. It's looking at right here, right now. And that's a reckless thing. The push for the popular vote has also become much more partisan. A 2012 Gallup poll shows 54 percent of Republicans and 69 percent of Democrats were in favor of changing it at the time. Four years later, 19 percent of Republicans and 81 percent of Democrats favored the change. Reading the tea leaves of their base, top Democrats Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg all agree it's time to get rid of the Electoral College. Liberal darling Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez calls it a scam. But amending the Constitution is a difficult and slow process. Instead of changing the rules, some experts suggest candidates consider changing their political strategy. I mean, there were a lot of states that flipped from one party to another that people thought were safe states uh, because of a specific candidate. I mean, you would think that the answer is to try to flip those states back, try to win back those voters instead of changing the rules of the game. Depending on who wins the White House in 2020, calls to end the Electoral College will likely either die down or greatly escalate. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. You know, folks, this country we live in is called the United States of America. 
The reason for that is because the Constitution, when it was first drafted, had to be ratified by, uh, I guess, a three-quarters majority of the states. Virginia refused to ratify until they passed the Bill of Rights because they didn't want a national religion. And they said Congress shall pass no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise. And then you go from there into you know, the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination and all these things in the Bill of Rights. It's there because Virginia said, no way, we're not going to be steamrolled. We're going to insist on having those, those 10 amendments to the Constitution before we ratify. But it is the United States and the way that it's done, every state has two senators. So each state has a voice. But in the popular House of Representatives, it is based on population. You get so many congressmen, depending on how many votes you have, how many citizens you have in your state. And if you have a lot of them, then you have a bigger number of congressmen. And um, the, the, the overall in the House doesn't change, but the number from your state changes, your percentage of the vote, so you can, that is a popular chamber. But the Electoral College is so important to the ongoing of our society. Because if, just imagine if California and New York decide the election every time of a president, uh, where will we be? And yet the smaller states, Nebraska, Oregon, Maine, these smaller states have a voice because they have so many uh, votes in the Electoral College. Not a lot, but they have a few. And those few make up the difference. And so there is attention on all those states by the people running for office. But again, this is the United States. And when it was all over and they came out of the um, Constitutional Convention, uh, or somebody asked Benjamin Franklin, what do, what do you have? He said, it's a republic if you can keep it. We have a republic. We do not have a democracy. This is not a populist democracy. We have a system of checks and balances. Why? Because the framers of our society recognized a, a, a moral truth that human beings are sinners. And they therefore did not wish to give sinners too much power. So you've got tremendous balance. You've got a House, you've got a Senate, you've got a Supreme Court, you've got legislature, you've got judiciary, you've got all these balances. You've got state governments, you've got federal governments, you've got all these laws. And it was deliberately set up to slow things down and to make a balance so that the one group couldn't oppress another. And the Electoral College is key to preserving a republic, which is what we have as the author of our freedom. And so I, I just want to say again, this move to throw the ballot, the Electoral College out is so ill-considered. And I, I hate to see what's going on in Richmond, Virginia, because when the Democrats take control of a state, they have their way of, of, of ruining a lot of things. The Democrats used to control the, the, the state of Virginia, but they were more conservative. And now it's, it's, it's Katie by the door. The stuff is coming out of Richmond. So anyhow. Well, it was done with intention and purpose, and we ought to understand well, that and appreciate it, it. It's a great system that was put in by the founding fathers who were brilliant, and they, they, they thought long and hard about it, and they had studied all the other uh, kingdoms of the world. They had they read the philosophies. They, they were learned men, and they weren't in, in, in the grip, if you will, of some... Uh, passion of the moment. All right, what's next? Well, coming up, a suicide grip nearly kills a weightlifter. A heavy barbell rolls out of his hands and right onto his throat. See the survival the doctors are calling miraculous when we come back. Whirlpool looked like a bullfrog, his bulbous neck visibly pulsated with every breath and heartbeat. Terry had been bench pressing 200 pounds. Then a barbell slipped out of his hands and crushed his throat. With blood spurting out and little air coming in, Terry feared he only had minutes left to live. It was about 6.30, 7 o'clock. I tried to go 
to the gym before I would work, but I decided that morning I was going to see just how strong I was, and I was by myself. And I got to about 2.05, and I was holding what they call suicide grip. That is whenever you don't wrap your thumb around the bar, it just lays on your, your hand. But the moment that I picked that bar up, and I remember they had a little bow in it. That bow was in the bottom. And as soon as I picked it up off the rack, it flipped out of my hand. Because my thumb was not wrapped around that bar, when it flipped, all it did was come straight down from the top of the rack to my neck. And, oh man. I remember it, it landed on my neck. And um, instantly, I knew I was in trouble. I remember it sitting on my neck, and I'm looking around, not knowing what to do, then, all, then I remember I didn't have the clip, so I just dumped the weights on one side, then the bar flipped back over to the other side. And I remember sitting up, and as soon as I sit up, blood started coming out of my mouth. I could actually feel my neck puffing in and out. And I, I remember saying the words, in the name of Jesus, I shall live and I shall not die. I go to the front of the gym, and the lady that runs the gym is sitting there, and as soon as she's seen me, she's seen my neck, because it turned black and blue instantly. She calls 911 immediately. When the ambulance got there, they get on the phone, they call Life Flight, and for some reason, Life Flight could not come get me. The only logical place to take me was not here in my hometown hospital, was the Chapel Hill, and from where we were at, it was about an hour. When Mr. Warpool presented to UNC Hospitals, he came in as a trauma red alert, um, which is essentially the highest acuity trauma that we have. Every time he took a breath, his neck would pop out like this. It's kind of like a bullfrog. Like, mm. I knew that we needed to go from the trauma bed to the operating room. They'd give me the medicine to put me to sleep. I could see the lights coming down the hallway, and they were cutting my neck open as we were talking. They cut me from here, and they cut me across here and I was talking to them while they were cutting me open. I remember that doctor was like, don't talk. When we first opened things up, I very quickly realized that it was a massively severe and complex injury. And the first thing that we did was pull the trachea out of the chest so that we could secure an airway. This kind of surgery really has two parts. One part is save the patient's life, and the second part is repair the organ that was damaged so that the patient can be functional in the long term. I think they had me sleeping for about two days so I, I didn't move. I remember the doctor came in the room after he woke me up and uh, he told me that it was impossible that I was here today. Medically, scientifically, I should have died. They estimated it being about 410 pounds of pressure because of the weight of the fall when it hit. From what I understand, that my voice box was completely crushed, and uh, I shouldn't be able to talk, and I should have had brain damage. I should have been paralyzed. The fact of the matter is, I wasn't supposed to live. I should have died in three, three and a half minutes, or however long a man can hold his breath. Then when it took me an hour and a half or so to actually have medical intervention inside of the hospital, I look at it now and I think to myself, God was just showing off. Some people would call it a miracle, and I would too. I think uh, divine intervention was involved. It should have been a year or two before I was able to do anything. And it wasn't three or four months. I'm active, doing what I love to do, uh, supporting my family, able to go back to work. It's hard to call anything else other than miraculous. I, I used to wonder, if God could really do this, or would he really do that, or, or you hear these stories, if, is, is that real, you know? And uh, I don't question that anymore. I don't question none of this, because I'm here today to tell you that uh, I shouldn't be here today. Don't question whether God can do whatever it is you need. He can, and we want to pray for you right now as we listen to Terry's story. I hope that it's built your faith to believe for whatever your need well, is. We also, I hope it will teach you when you, you know, I, I got stuck with a load of weight, a couple hundred pounds, and I pushed the thing up and I couldn't go, I was stuck. I couldn't get it up, I couldn't get it down. And so I laid it down on my chest and then I rolled that whole thing down my chest. And you talk about sore. It was awful. But folks, 
you know, if you're into weightlifting, and I was for a time, make sure there's a spotter with you. I mean, what we saw is a miracle, but he's very fortunate to be alive. But that reverse thing, that that's, I mean. Not using your thumb. Oh, yeah, the, man. Ridiculous. But anyhow, God bless you. We've got some wonderful Thank answers. You. Here's you? some other answers to prayer. This is Evelyn Pat. She lives in Center Ridge, Arkansas. She has a sister named Annette who suffered from a torn meniscus. She was in tremendous pain trying to walk her flight of stairs. Well, Evelyn heard you give a word of knowledge saying, right now there is a knee that has been twisted. The Lord is bringing that knee into alignment. Any damage that's been done is being healed dramatically in Jesus' name. Evelyn claimed it for Annette and called to let her know. The next day, the pain in Annette's knee left her entirely. She was able to go up and down the stairs with these, so she canceled her surgery. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Remote control. Wow. Here's one. Uh, for 20 years, Donna, who lives in Mount Holly, North Carolina, was bent over and couldn't walk because of scoliosis. She was watching this program, and Terry was saying, somebody has an unstable walk. God is healing you. You will walk completely firmly with purpose. So by faith, Donna knew Terry was praying for her. She called CBN's prayer line. She could now walk upright with no scoliosis. Hallelujah. Another miracle. Yeah. That's a miracle. Well, listen, God is able. Yes. We are seeing more and more. He is able. You know, God had created the earth the stars, the moon, the planets. He created everything that lives. He created the plants. He created it all. And He created you, and He knows how to fix you because He put you together the way you are. And He knows exactly every molecule in your body. He knows where every bone is. He knows every... And He knows your financial circumstances. So Terry and I are going to join together in prayer. And I want you, wherever you are, just pray with us. Nothing is impossible with the God we serve. Nothing is impossible. Father, I join with my sister in Christ, and we pray together in Jesus' name. Somebody's got a bubble this, uh, break on your aorta. I mean, there's like a bulb coming out. And right now, put your hand on your chest in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, Terry, go ahead. Someone else, uh, you have difficulty swallowing, but you have a very bad cough. It is not the coronavirus. This is actually chronic. You've had it for a long time, but today is your day. You are being healed of everything that creates that cough that's consistently an issue for you. Right now, it's gone in Jesus' name. Uh, somebody, Marcy, I believe, is, has... You've got trouble in your lymph systems. You may have had some uh, lymph nodes re removed because of breast cancer, but whatever it is, God right now is healing your lymph system and any swelling that's there is being taken away. And right now, people are saying, I need hope. Yes. And God is going to give you hope. The Lord is able. So He says, trust me. And if you'll trust Him, all things are possible with the one the Lord loves. Terry? Yes, someone, you have a, your hips are out of alignment. You're actually seeing someone about that right now. You're having some different treatments done, but it affects your gait. It affects, um, it, there's pain in your hip, pain in your knee, pain in your foot. God is healing all of that for you right now. From your waist on down, everything is set in order in Jesus' name. Somebody has got a, your big toe is out of alignment. Cecilia, is that the name? It's got the toe. Just reach down and touch that foot, and that toe will be completely healed, and any bunions there will go away in the name of Jesus. Touch him. Now, Lord, may the power of God be in the lives of people right now. May they know your presence, and may they worship you. Receive an answer, folks, to the deepest need of your heart. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. amen. Terry. We've got a minute. No. Yes, well, still to come, another round of your questions and some honest answers. Ray says, I've done drugs, I've lied, lusted, and committed adultery. What, if anything, can I do to be saved? Stay tuned for Pat's answer. It's coming up on today's show.
and welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Spreading joy, not germs, with their classes now online, teachers in one Indiana community are going the extra mile to check on their students. Just for them today to go out on their own time to go say hi really makes the kids feel loved. These teachers putting on a parade of sorts for children at home, driving through neighborhoods and waving from their windows and sunroofs. Across the country, the global caravan trend is taking hold as we all try to keep our social distance. Countries all over the world are working to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, but school children in one part of Africa are taking a different step. In Mozambique, they're using the power of prayer to fight the virus. A Facebook post went viral showing pictures of the students placing their hands on a map over different countries suffering from outbreaks and bowing their heads in prayer for protection. At the time, Mozambique had no confirmed cases. Now the country has its first patient, a 70-year-old man, who traveled from Britain. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Store shelves are bare and basic necessities hard to come by. That's what many people are now facing in the wake of the coronavirus. What's even worse, food pantries are having to close their doors. Take a look. With the uncertainty and constraints of a worldwide pandemic, those who struggled before to put food on the table are having an even tougher time now. I mean, the store shelves are bare. There's no bread, there's no milk, there's, there's just so very little things. To make matters worse, many food pantries that normally take care of these vulnerable families are closing their doors. We just left a place in Norfolk that was closed. So we kind of were giving up hope. There's still some keeping their doors open. Operation Blessing partner Faith World Ministries usually runs a walkthrough food pantry out of their gym. Now it's curbside service. And this gives me renewed hope in people. Suffolk Christian Fellowship, another Operation Blessing partner, doesn't have a parking lot, but they're still determined to serve. Ministry Director Lorna Slaughter. We are in a crisis right now. We do know that this virus is out there and we know that all of us are prone to be affected. But at the same time, we also know that we still, there's still a great need out there and that need has to be met. We're sanitizing hands when, they, when you come in the door. We're actually trying to make sure that people are not right up on each other. Next we're just trying to do all we can to make sure that we try to stay as safe as possible. These ministries face a tough problem. We do see more people coming in. Grocery stores, of course, they're, they're thin right now, and so people are coming to pantries where they can get the, the additional goods that they need. The influx is coming, not only new people, but we're actually seeing people that are regularly coming in. They're coming in more throughout the week. But this time I see fear. People are asking for additional um, goods and items because there's a fear that, of course, is present right now. And people believe there is a comfort in having enough goods. When Operation Blessing learned our longtime trusted partners in the Hampton Roads area needed extra support, we were all in. While continuing our usual shipments, we identified key local ministries as distribution hubs for additional supplies. Then we loaded up trucks with extra pallets of food and water and sent them off. When we were asked to, about being a hub for Operation Blessing because our partnership is already there, we were immediately saying yes because I knew that we were going to have the need. We are very excited about getting the goods. We need the goods and the goods are going out the door. Just We got them yesterday, they're going out today. People in need are especially thankful for our donors and partners who make it possible for us to help that little bit extra during these tough times. It's so wonderful to see the kind side of human nature. And honestly, I wouldn't be eating if it weren't for this. So it is a blessing to me. And it's because of Operation Blessing and y'all being open through this tragedy that we're able to make ends meet. And I thank you. Meeting people right at their point of need. Can I just say that's what CBN is doing here at home and around the world. And 
it's one of the reasons that we ask you to join the 700 Club because a portion of every gift that you give goes to the work of Operation Blessing. And you'll be touching people in need here at home and all throughout the world. And so do that now, won't you? It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month. But join with the rest of us because when we all join together, we really can make a difference. Here's how you do that. You call our toll-free number. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we're going to send you as our thank you, Pat. Pat's latest book, 10 Laws for Success, filled with wisdom on how to live. For wisdom and work, family and finance, you want to get a hold of this. And then we're going to send you a preview of his book that's soon to be published. I have walked with the living God 90 years of faith and how God has been faithful to every need that Pat has had over that time. We want you to have both of these. So call now. If you'd like to designate your gift to, uh, to Operation Blessing, you can do that. This is how you do that. You just send it if you're mailing it to Operation Blessing, CBN. Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463, or you can go online to cbn.com and look for Operation Blessing on their site. So Wonderful. we got Wonderful. some questions. You ready? Let's take a couple. Okay. Gotta... Ray says, I'm 65 with severe COPD. I was baptized at age 11, but I've been away from God for years. I've used his name in vain, run off three children, drunk booze, did drugs, lied, lusted, and committed adultery. I've always believed in God and know Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected for me, yet my sins are are many and horrible. What, if anything, can I do to be saved? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all those with all that's in within me, bless his holy name, who forgives all your iniquities, Thank who you. crowns you with loving kindness, who forgives your iniquities as far as the east is from the west. You come to the Lord and he you know, he said in Ezekiel, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to hurt you. Yes, you've done all kinds of horrible things. But will God forgive you? Yes. Yes. You know, bless the Lord. He will forgive you all your iniquities. So take that. And But at the same time, if anybody is in Christ, he cannot keep on sinning. You can't keep on doing that stuff. If you really know the Lord, you will not do, you won't continue in sin, okay? All right. This is Diane who says, do you think if people started paying cash for things, our deficit would go down? I don't think anything has to do. Look, when you're talking about trillions of dollars, your little bit of cash that you pay for your groceries has got nothing to do with it. I mean. It's so insignificant. No, it's not going to make any difference whether you pay in cash or you put it on a credit card. It doesn't make a bit of difference. It does to you personally, but it doesn't to the overall seam of thing. Well, today's power minute is from the Psalms. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Well, tomorrow we've got a pastor who's on death door. A rare disease infected his brain. How did he survive? We'll give you that story tomorrow on the 700 Club. So for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you for being with us, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.